Hello magpies, and welcome back to the homelands of heterodoxy, where I provide you with rules and with lore for playing in over 40 different nations of Faerun. Either in the core setting, or in my own world, set 100 years into the future of Faerun. To swoop is to know, so let us swoop together. The Western Palatinate covers a vast territory of untamed frontiers, of growing nations, and of hidden treasures. As well as some of the wealthiest and most powerful cities of Faerun. In terms of settlement, it largely consists of independent city-states, ruled, at least on paper, by Waterdeep as the wealthiest power in the region. But in reality, each city is free to govern as they wish. The true power in the Western Heartlands is the Hanseatic League, an immensely powerful federation of guilds that control the flow of trade throughout the Heartlands. It is also home to the controversial Sunset Vale, a rising power in the region. So first we shall explore this upstart nation called the Sunset Vale. And if you've already watched the lore videos, then you have some idea as to what they are all about. Perhaps the Vale is best described as a great bastion of high fantasy in an increasingly lawful age of human dominance, with heretical cults and non-human races popping up everywhere all over the Sunset Vale and contributing to creating a truly cosmopolitan culture. Inhabitants of the Vale speak Chondathan as their common tongue, and the region consists of four principalities and two frontier territories, each with their own unique character and regional equipment. Now just as a note, uh, observe that the rules and requirements for regional equipment are covered in part one of this series. So, the first principality, known as the Jewel of the Vale, is the city of Burdusk. It is a libertarian's dream where communities are given the right to self-governance, within reason. Ostensibly ruled by the Bard Princess Circe, the founder of the heretical faith, Burdusk is home to Twilight Hall, being the headquarters of the Harpers, an ancient Bardic college that opposes tyranny and defends civilization. The city of Burdusk is a hotbed of learning, of philosophical inquiry, and of heretical cults. Inhabitants of Burdusk who meet the requirements for regional equipment may take two second level spell scrolls as an investment in their future. The central principality of Usbraven, ruled by their druidic princess Roisin, is not a city per se with no walls or clear boundaries, but Rather, it is a sprawling marketplace linking farmlands to merchants, and is the centre of agricultural activity that supports the entire Vale. The finest light war horses in all of the West are trained here, and are highly sought after, with horse and rider bonded together from birth. It is also home to the Red Cloaks, being a volunteer militia that controls, uh, patrols rather, patrols the roads and defends the farmlands of the Vale. Inhabitants of Asbraven may receive a war horse and saddle, for the horse is the heart of the heartlands. Known as the City of Spires, Erebor is a principality ruled by the assassin Prince Catalia. 
It is the epitome of wealth, of excess, and of prestige. Merchant houses compete to build the largest, most extravagant towers. And floating above them all, in his flying pleasure palace, Catalia is protected by his night blades, a former assassin's guild turned order of knights. Those who live in the city below are constantly threatened by the collapse of towers and must eke out a living on whatever scraps of wealth trickle down from above. Being a place of extreme wealth, inhabitants of Erebor may start with an extra 300 gold pieces. But keep in mind that this obviously must be justified somehow. So if your character does not come from wealthy means, well, that probably means that somebody somewhere is probably looking to get their money back. To the north, the Principality of Hluthvar is a mighty fortress city, ruled by the paladin Prince Tuba, and forms a hub of Illuscan Viking culture in the heartlands intersecting with Western notions of chivalry. It is home to the Knights of Helm, a paladin order who form the closest thing that the Vale has to a professional army, seeing as the Harpers are better suited to spying and diplomacy. But Luthfar is also famous for its high quality arts and crafts especially metalworking, woodworking, poetry, and dance. All inhabitants of Luthva train in swordsmanship, and may take either a longsword or a greatsword as their regional equipment. Next, in the northernmost reaches of the Vale, stands the birthplace of its rulers, the lonely castle Wyvernspur. Declared neutral territory, this fort serves as a safe haven for adventurers delving into the dangerous northern lands. Though only a handful of individuals call this castle home, its reputation for hospitality makes it a hotbed for artistic expression and the diffusion of news from afar with many bards making a pilgrimage to the lonely castle to seek inspiration. Those who stand watchful guard on the walls and defend travellers may receive a suit of breastplate armour for their service. Finally, the northern badlands comprise the entire northern province of the Vale, including the bandit town of Cormorp. Life is tough in the Badlands, and as such, those strong enough to survive in this wasteland receive proficiency in the survival skill in place of regional equipment. Though if your background package already gives you survival, you may pick any skill from the Barbarian skill list instead and be proficient in that. As an addendum, the Sunset Vale is also home to the largest surviving population of Halruans, after their homeland was destroyed by a volcano approximately 20 years ago. Halruans are the last descendants of ancient Netheril, and every single one of them exhibit magical talents that guide their chosen professions in life. Halruans may take their own unique regional equipment package, which is unique to their race. To qualify, in addition to the normal requirements for regional equipment, uh, Halruan characters must take the homebrew subrace I created for Halruans, which will be covered in a future video, and must either be first generation refugees who are old enough to remember their homelands or they must be second generation refugees who actively keep their heritage and culture alive. 
The regional equipment consists of either six first level and sorry of either six first level spell scrolls or two second level spell scrolls or they may take uh, potions of such value equaling 300 gold or less all faiths can be found in the sunset veil in one form or another including the worship of the seven divines but certain faiths have found greater reach in certain principalities and territories. In Asbraven, Chontia and Rainier are the most prominent, where nature is revered holistically. In Burdusk, there is a vast library to Denier in Twilight Hall, as well as various cults, including the archivist cult that mas masquerades as followers of Denier, and as spellcasters of various professions. There is also the Thaumaturgist cult that pretends to be followers of Gond, and the post-Diluvian cult of Marsala. In Castle Wyvernspur, shrines to Finder Wyvernspur and Helm are kept. In Hluthvar, Andurus and Helm are worshipped side by side, sometimes as one and the same while Erebor is home to rich temples of Eldath, Joaquin, and the secret worship of Azrai. Finally, in the northern Badlands, offerings to Malar and Timora are favoured, and some even revere a strange extra-dimensional being known as the Stranger that haunts the ruins of Darkhold and seems to hold power over time itself. Rather than encapsulating a single historical analogue, the Sunset Veil is built on the idea of a melting pot of ideas, cultures, and of the blurred line between faith and reality. The native Gua nomads living largely outside of society are based on the Romani people, while the rest of human population forms a kind of a rough three-way demographic split between the Chondathans, analogous to the Franks, the Aluskans being the Norse, and a slight numerical majority of Celtic Tetherians. Throw in the almost Moorish Halruans and suddenly the veil begins to encapsulate the major cultural influences over so much of the medieval world. If the Sunset Veil does have an overarching historical analogue, however, it is partly inspired by the south of France in the 13th century, who were inadequately served by the church who favoured the more privileged northern regions, driving the south to create their own clerical traditions in what came to be known as the Cathar heresy. Next up, the Western Heartlands describes the area stretching from Arm to the northern glacier and from the imperial capital to the Sword Coast excluding Waterdeep and the Sunset Vale. It is a loose collection of independent city-states, often ruled by wealthy former adventurers, by merchant confederacies, or by old dynastic bloodlines. The largest such city is Baldur's Gate, which is currently embroiled in a bitter war against the Dro to the south. The culture of the Western Heartlands is very similar to what is found in the Imperial Capital, though the nature of living in a vast frontier means that folk tend to value freedom and those who dislike their neighbours may simply pack up and find a new community of like-minded souls. As such, the Western Heartlands is somewhat paradoxically a diverse, 
and an insular region at once. Inhabitants of the Western Heartlands speak Chondathan as their common tongue, and may take either a long sword or a great sword, or they may take a suit of breastplate armor, or they may take a potion of lesser restoration. I've been deliberately vague in justifying these because given how diverse the Western Heartlands are, you shouldn't really have any problem justifying these gifts. All faiths are found in the Western Heartlands. Though worship of the Seven Divines is fairly rare here with the old gods still holding sway, amidst a general animosity towards the Sunset Vale. Regardless, the Methuselan cult of Marsala is growing in popularity with sailors along the Sword Coast, much to the displeasure of the established priesthood. As historical analogues go, the Western Heartlands is kind of what it would look like if there were 20 times as many Italian city-states spread out over the entire American Midwest. Which in some ways I guess describes the Holy Roman Empire, being the medieval collection of territories that predated Germany. Appropriate then, I suppose, that I named the massive guild monopoly, the Hanseatic League, being the same name as the mercantile and defensive confederacy that spanned northern Germany and the Baltics. Waterdeep is the wealthiest of all the cities along the Sword Coast, and famous enough to deserve its own category. Known as the City of Splendors, it is among the most well-known adventuring cities in Faerun. It's hard to imagine a more cosmopolitan center of trade, with even extra-dimensional travelers making their pilgrimage to Waterdeep to browse or to trade. Inhabitants of Waterdeep speak Chondathan as their common tongue, and for their regional equipment, they may choose uh, to take a weapon representing the swashbuckling independent spirit of the Sword Coast, of either a long sword, a rapier, or a short sword. Or perhaps they may come from an educated background, receiving two second level spell scrolls. Or maybe they come from an from old money and from a life of leisure, or are simply blessed by the Lady of Luck, giving them an extra 300 gold pieces. All faiths are to be found in Waterdeep, but especially Denia, Mistra and Ogma, as well as the Methuselan cult of Marsala. As an historical analogue, Waterdeep is part Milan, G Fr Genoa or Florence, and perhaps even echoes of Constantinople, being the epitome of an independent wealthy trading port. However, being the focal point of so much official law in some ways, Waterdeep surpasses historical analogues. Being reinvented so many times, it is kind of a canvas onto which you may paint a landscape of urban high fantasy in whatever tones you desire. The colder lands to the north of Waterdeep are collectively known as the Savage North. Though it is home to some of the greatest cities of Faerun, such as Neverwinter, those who live elsewhere still regard the region as uncivilized. To be fair, it is a place of harsh, frozen environs, of hardy folk, and of fearsome monsters. So in some ways the reputation is not entirely undeserved. It is also home to the Uthgat Barbarians, the progenitors of the Aluskans who worship animal totems in place of a pantheon of gods. Inhabitants of the North 
are bilingual, one and all, uh, gaining both Chondathan and Iluskan as their uh, common tongues. They may also pick from either studded leather and a potion of pass without trace, being essential items for surviving the fro frozen wilderness. Or they may choose from a selection of Iluskan weaponry, taking either a battle axe, a warhammer, or a longsword. As indeed, those of the North who do not have the luxury of hiding must stand and fight. Most faiths can be found in the North, but the most populous in worship is the pantheon of animal totems that makes up the Uthgat religion. The historical analogues of the savage North speak to the great cities of Rome and the Germanic peoples who settled outside their walls. Or perhaps it evokes the harsh winters of Scandinavia with echoes of the proud native peoples of Siberia. The Shining City of Silvery Moon, known as the Gem of the North, is the favoured city of Mistra, the goddess of magic. And it is as well the capital of an independent confederacy of satellite towns, known as Luruwa, or the Silver Marches. So far separated are they from the rest of Faerun that they must govern and protect their own borders, wholly independent of outside interference or aid. In times past, Silvery Moon was frequented by some of the most powerful and famous heroes of all Faerun, and all of whom left their mark on the city. Today, the name of Silvery Moon evokes legends that all know, but few shall ever lay eyes upon the city itself. Inhabitants of Silvery Moon and Luruwa speak both Chondathan and Iluskan as their common tongue, and may also choose from several common adventuring weapons either a longsword, a rapier, or a longbow with arrows. Alternately, they may take a lightweight chain shirt to continue the adventuring tradition of past heroes, or they may study in the ancient libraries favoured by the Lady of Magic, and receive studded leather armour and a second level spell scroll for even wizards must seek additional protection in the harsh northern lands. The major faiths of Silvery Moon are Helm, Lathanda, Mieliki, Morden, Mistra, Ogma, Salune, Sune, and Taimora, as well as being the site of a revival of the once lost worship of Corallon Lorethian. Silvery Moon defies historical analogues and falls more into the realm of mythology. It might better be compared to Atlantis, Rivendell, or the Celtic promised land of Tirnanog than as any real world city or nation. It's important to remember this is still a fantasy game after all. Finally, among the nations of the great western heartlands, we close with a glimpse into the high forest. These days this region is an ungoverned wilderness, but in times past it was ruled by the elves. Following their great retreat, the elves left behind their hidden cities, which led many adventurers among those with cause to flee civilization, to delve into these woods, often never to be seen again. A select few manage to eke out a living among the gnolls, the orcs, and the fey who have retaken this place, but rumours abound of fallen elves and of idealistic adventurers 
who have taken up residence in the high forest to reclaim and recapture the noble spirit of the elven homeland. Inhabitants of the high forest speak Chondathan as their common tongue. And those rare individuals who live in precarious and often short-lived communes, they will adopt the weapons of the elven kingdoms that came before them, taking either a longsword or a lance in imitation of the knights of Mithranor. Others may take a longbow and arrows as a sensible staple of woodland survival, while pragmatists favour a potion of endure elements to survive in the unforgiving climate and harsh winters. The major faiths of the High Forest are Illustrae, Malar, Miliki, and Sylvanus, as well as the intermittent restoration of Corlan Lorethian's temples. And the occasional worship of Veyron by half-dro fleeing war and persecution. The High Forest isn't so much an historical analogue as it is an aesthetic. It is a vision board populated by dreams of a golden age of lost empires, of unforgiving frontiers, and with the land itself overflowing as an emissary of ages, burying and erasing the past. On that note, magpies, this brings us to the end of the Western Palatinate, and the second part in this series. Keep your fur cloaks close though, for next we march north into the cold and war-torn homelands of the Damaran peoples. Thank you, magpies, and I shall see you again when next you grace this place with your occasion.